Cecile approached me a little while ago to uh, speak on the issue of, uh, or in the context of uh, criminalization of HIV. Um, and I uh, was very frank with her. Um, I happen to be one of those people that uh, knows what he knows and knows even better what he doesn't know. Uh, so I know nothing about law. All I can tell you is that criminalizing HIV disclosure and related matters makes my life miserable and uh, makes the life of my patients miserable. And if it makes my life miserable, it means that I cannot deliver the programs that I'm here to deliver, and therefore it must be wrong, and I trust that you will fix it. <laughs> uh, it's good to have such a simplistic approach in life. Uh, so I told her, look, I'm not going to talk about criminalization. I'm going to tell you uh, what we do, and I'm going to let you uh, hopefully conclude uh, whether or not you feel that by driving people underground, and making their life and my life miserable, uh, you're actually achieving the intended uh, goals. Uh, and I'm going to do that from the perspective of the Stop HIV and AIDS in BC initiative, which uh, is the acronym for Seek and Treat to Optimally Prevent HIV and AIDS in British Columbia. Uh, this is an initiative that we started a number of years ago, and I'm going to basically tell you the story how this came about. I apologize because I hear that at least one person heard me uh, given a longer version of this talk uh, last Friday, uh, but that story is what it is and I can't change it. Um, back in 1981, when I arrived to this country, HIV had not yet been invented, so to speak. Uh, it was hanging around, but it had not been uh, uh, identified. Uh, it wasn't until 1982 or thereabouts uh, that uh, we started tracking this condition. Uh, it hit uh, um, our uh, shores, if you want, uh, around 83, 84, at which time I was doing my pulmonary recent uh, um, uh, respiratory training, and, uh, and I became inundated and basically swamped by it. Uh, I ended up doing uh, uh, HIV medicine uh, really because uh, it, it did it to me, not because I was intended to do that. Um, as the lower member of the hierarchy in respiratory, I was assigned to look after PCP. I got better at it, and the, and the rest is history. Um, what you see here is the mortality curve associated with HIV, AIDS, in the United States in males aged 25 to 44. Uh, I could show you a similar curve for Canada. I will show you one for British Columbia shortly. And uh, what uh, this illustrates is that in 1992, uh, when the BC Center was created, uh, this uh, disease was taking uh, really, really serious epidemic uh, conditions. Imagine that we were starting to get ourselves uh, organized to deal with an epidemic of CMV-related blindness on young males in the downtown and, uh, and west end of Vancouver uh, because we could treat the complications, but we could not stop the successive uh, 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 multiple uh, infections that uh, people affected by HIV were having. Um, unbeknownst to us, in 1993-94, uh, we secured uh, the so-called contract uh, to run the Vancouver Conference in, Van uh, in Vancouver, of course, in 1996. Um, in 1994, uh, we worked with a bunch of marketing types. I tend to hate those people, but nonetheless. Um, and we were forced to come up with a slogan for the conference. Uh, we arrived to this uh, one world, one hope. I often tell people uh, we knew there was one world affected by HIV. We didn't know there was a hope at the time. And, uh, and we coerced, uh, to, for lack of a better word, uh, Joe Average, uh, into coming up with uh, something that depicted uh, an image to that theme, and this is what he came up with. Uh, that was a very nice uh, gesture on his part and a, a piece that we still love. Uh, this was 1994. Uh, for those of you that remember, we didn't have an effective therapy at that time. We, if, we, if, if anything, we had a palliative uh, treatment that was uh, mono and dual uh, antiretroviral therapies. But we were fortunate that we started um, uh, tampering with uh, uh, other approaches, including triple drug therapy, and totally unbeknownst to us, uh, uh, in 1995, I got the results of a trial that I was leading, the INCAS trial, uh, an, an international study involving Italy, Netherlands, Canada, Australia, and the United States, um, that was exploring for the first time triple therapy uh, for individuals who had never received antiretroviral therapy before. Long and behold, and without getting into the details, uh, we found that we could not find, vi find virus in the blood of these people. and We didn't really know what that meant. Uh, in fact, uh, at the very early, uh, um, in the very early days of that uh, observation, uh, we thought it was an, a, a, a laboratory artifact. 
Um, eventually, we put the data together. We found that uh, with triple therapy, we could suppress the replication of the virus. This was uh, independently verified by a study Merck 035 by Trip Gullick in New York, uh, showing the same thing with a different approach. And in February of uh, the next year, 1996, uh, John Mellors actually first presented at the retrovirus meeting a, a, a seminal paper that showed that individuals with low virus load in their blood uh, had a very good prognosis, 0% likelihood of progressing to age over three years, in, in comparison to people who had high viral load and low CD4s uh, who were uh, having a 100% likelihood of progressing to age and, and potentially death within a very, very short period of time. These three pieces of data, isolated as they were in February, gave us the uh, energy, if you want, uh, to run with it and made the assumption, at this time it was an assumption, there was no data to support it, that if we move somebody with treatment uh, from this bar here, uh, high viral load, to a bar here, low viral load, we would see a change in prognosis as you see here. Uh, a group of uh, equally minded uh, individuals under the auspices of the International Aid Society USA drafted a bunch of guidelines. Uh, it was the best we could guess at the time. Uh, we brought it to the public or to the rest of the audience at the Vancouver International Conference. Antiretroviral therapy as we know it today, heart, was born. And this is what happened to the epidemic starting in 1995-96. Uh, you see mortality rates coming down to very small uh, rates among those uh, engaged with antiretroviral therapy and remaining so uh, ever since. Uh, we have seen dramatic improvements on the life expectancy of HIV. This uh, marked the beginning of a change uh, for uh, HIV and AIDS from a rapidly lethal disease uh, to a chronic manageable condition. And the reality is that today it is indeed a chronic manageable condition uh, and a number of people in the audience can ex speak experientially about it much better than I can do. In those days, we didn't have the data to really uh, 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 put the whole story together, uh, but we did have the courage to do this, to create these guidelines, uh, because the pressure under which we were operating, uh, as illustrated in slide number two, was dramatic. Those, uh, that red line going up, it was a very devastating thing. Everybody could see it. It was headlines every day. Uh, so there was a desire to do something dramatic uh, because the epidemic was conceived as being something very severe that was happening in our midst. Uh, today, unfortunately, the political leadership is not there at the federal level in this country anyways. Uh, to do the right things because they don't know and they don't care, and if they don't, they don't care, but for sure, about what's happening with HIV transmission. Because I would argue that today we have the tools to control, if not uh, completely, uh, dramatically, uh, the impact of HIV in our communities, both when it, when it comes to morbidity, when it comes to mortality, and when it comes to HIV transmission. And that leads me to the second part of my um, introductory remarks, which relates to the role of antiretroviral therapy in stopping HIV transmission. Very early on, when we first rolled out antiretroviral therapy, starting in 1996 to 1999, we saw for the first time something that we were not expecting or anticipating. And it was a marked decrease in the number of new, uh, newly identified HIV positive individuals in the province of British Columbia. And no matter what they told me, I could not explain this by anything else than the fact that we rolled out antiretroviral therapy. I'll show you more data in a moment. People uh, argue all kinds of things, uh, changes in behavior, changes in this, changes in the weather, whatever. But the reality was that none of that was operational. Uh, uh, just to give you a sense that changes in behavior could not explain this, you see syphilis rates going up even in our own clinic, and yet the rates of uh, HIV uh, mostly sexually uh, transmitted in those days, uh, was remarkably stable. Uh, I, I remind you that in these days, HIV in our community was predominantly an MSM or uh, gay uh, concern. Today, it has spread uh, outside of that uh, environment quite, quite a bit. Anyways, we already at that time felt quite, quite uh, strongly that the role of antiretroviral therapy had played a role on slowing down the spread of HIV. We couldn't prove it until we came across this data. Uh, this is data uh, regarding uh, 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 women infected with HIV on the light blue and, uh, and the children of those women being born with HIV. This is pan-Canadian data. And what it shows is that very early on, um, between 1990 and 1996, 30 to 50% of uh, the uh, pregnancies among HIV-infected women ended up with a baby that was HIV-positive. 
However, after 1996, the pivotal year in terms of uh, therapeutic intervention for the epidemic, you see that that ratio changes dramatically. And uh, I'm happy to tell you that in the last several years, uh, we, have had, we have had only a couple of cases where systemic failure in identifying uh, the mother being infected with HIV has led to two uh, cases of uh, babies born in H with HIV in BC. Uh, but other than that, uh, we've done remarkably well. And the reason for that is that we now offer antiretroviral therapy to a woman infected with HIV, and the baby uh, is therefore being born without HIV. So with these two pieces of data alone, I can tell you that HIV prevents um, morbidity, prevents uh, age-related death, uh, and prevents HIV transmission in the mother-to-child uh, context dramatically, as you can see here. And I would argue that we have epidemiological evidence that is happening as well uh, in the uh, rest of the community. A woman infected with HIV 15 years ago would have been told that they had no expectation to have a normal reproductive life. Today we will say, yes, you will have a relatively preserved reproductive life, and by the way, you're going to be alive and well by the time your child graduates in university, and after that, uh, you're on your own. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we are uh, working with a number of people, including Martin, who is in the audience, put together a case for expansion uh, of the access to highly active antiretroviral therapy to curb the growth of the HIV epidemic that ended up being a, a pivotal pa pa paper at the Toronto conference and in the Lancet in 2006. That, that was uh, a fairly controversial uh, paper at the time. We simply stated that heart stops HIV replication. For the non-medical types in the audience, let me tell you that that happens the same day that you start taking the medication. Uh, it is remarkably effective at doing so. Uh, People infected with HIV, they have residual amounts of detectable virus in the blood and body fluids after they, stop, they start taking the medication. Uh, but that's a function of the virus that was generated prior to starting the treatment. Uh, once they start the treatment, there is no new virus. And what happens is that the so-called reticular endothelial system, which is the vacuum cleaner that we all have within us, uh, is only able to clear 90% of the virus per month. So it takes X number of months to clear the virus that you have. Eventually, within three to six months, the virus is uh, non-detectable. And when that happens, it eventually becomes non-detectable in sexual fluids and other biological fluids. Therefore, there is no further transmission. That's as simple as that. We were interested to see whether or not this principle was operational in uh, the one setting where is, there is very effective uh, transmission of HIV in our environment. That is to say, the downtown east side among injection drug users. And uh, credit goes to uh, Evan Wood from our group, uh, who was able to come up with the notion that in that setting, the best way to approach this issue was not to look at the individual uh, rates of transmission, but the community rates of transmission using a community viral load or the average amount of virus circulating in the community as the driver of transmission. And so we did exactly that, taking advantage of the long-standing cohorts that we have in that area. Uh, we retrospectively uh, uh, check for viral load over time. You see six blocks of viral load. That means uh, in excess of 100,000 copies of virus uh, going down uh, from six zeros to five zeros to four zeros. That's uh, so that the lawyers can follow. Uh, and then eventually becoming undetectable down here. What you see then is that when you superimpose on that uh, the rate of zero conversion, in other words, the new infections that we saw uh, uh, over every period uh, in this study, you find that a high amount of virus in the community uh, drives increasing number of new infections. As this goes down, uh, the new infections go down. When we looked at these using statistical models, we found that the virus load, not the sharing of needles, was the actual driver of HIV zero conversion uh, by a factor by, by an order of magnitude uh, 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 more powerful as a driver, of fa uh, the driver factor for zero, uh, zero conversions than uh, that sharing needles. The message is loud and clear. If there is no HIV, you can share needles all you want, and you're not going to get HIV. If there is HIV in the community, all you need is to share a little bit of, of, of needles, and you're going to get the HIV. Don't get me wrong, we're not recommending that people share needles. You can get other bad things, but when it comes to HIV, it's not the needles is the virus in the community that does it. This has now been reproduced, by the way, uh, by the Baltimore uh, cohort, so you have an independently validated study uh, to show that this is the case. 
We were very fortunate that uh, Gordon Campbell himself, and I'm not, not here to make a political statement, but uh, uh, I, I, I should acknowledge the fact that he was quite willing to embark on this work at a time it was not politically appealing for most people. Uh, Gordon Campbell supported our uh, desire to expand antiretroviral therapy coverage, uh, and so he opened the gates at a time in which everything else was uh, being cut down uh, to, for us to expand antiretroviral therapy. And I'm going to show you then uh, uh, a final set of slides um, uh, illustrating uh, what our experience has been with the expansion of antiretroviral therapy in British Columbia uh, in terms of uh, preventing transmissions. You see here the number of people on blue um, uh, who are taking antiretroviral therapy for any given, any given year. Uh, you see that there is a reciprocal curve, the red. Uh, the more people took antiretroviral therapy, the less new infections we identified. When we reach a plateau in the number of people on antiretroviral therapy, the new infections also plateau. When we re-expanded uh, our antiretroviral therapy program, uh, there is a reciprocal uh, decline on uh, uh, the number of people identified with HIV infection. We also learned from this figure on the green uh, the, the situation of the uh, uh, injection drug uses in the province of British Columbia, and we find that until initiatives were put in place that facilitated access for IDUs uh, throughout the province, we did not have a province-wide effect, as you see here, a 50% decrease on HIV new cases starting in 2007-2008, and that has been sustained into 2010. 2010 has seen the lowest number of HIV infections in this province, now at 301 cases uh, for the year uh, 2010, uh, remaining uh, the lowest year for IDUs as well. So we're winning, uh, and we'd like to expand that to the rest of the country. Uh, you see that this is happening at a time in which hepatitis, syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea have not gone down, indicating that this is not because other bloodborne or sexually transmitted diseases are going down. This is exclusive to HIV. This is exclusively related to the expansion of antiretroviral therapy. And let me reassure you that this is not about just stopping transmission. And I'll share with you uh, my own private motivation why we started in this, in this uh, to look at this issue in this way. Uh, the government was talking about putting quotas on the number of people that were accessing antiretroviral therapy because it was getting too expensive. Actually, the deputy minister at the time told me personally, uh, even a good thing can become unaffordable. And I said, well, you're making a mistake because getting more treatment on the hands of people with HIV will also stop the epidemic. And that's where basically got the whole discussion going. But I want to reassure you that our expansion of treatment, as you see here, has also led to a decrease in the mortality in the province. And I have data that I'm not going to uh, expand on showing that this decrease is being seen today in every health authority in the province of British Columbia. Unfortunately, not in the rest of the country. And uh, just to illustrate the fact that it's not true in the rest of the country, uh, these are the numbers for HIV new diagnosis in British Columbia. We used to have the worst epidemic in the country on the red here back in 1996. Prior to 1996, it was equally bad. And you see here a decrease that was quite marked, and it continues into 2009. There is a further uh, drop in 2010. You see that no other region in the country has shown a significant decrease. And in fact, some regions, like Saskatchewan, driving the prairie curve, uh, has seen an increase somewhere between four and, and six-fold, driven primarily by the neglect that we subjected to the First Nations in particular. Um, uh, I'm uh, also... I'd be remiss not to tell you that even uh, Newfoundland and the city of Ottawa uh, have seen marked increases uh, that have been reported recently. Uh, uh, so there is more that we could do uh, to make things better elsewhere in the country, including in Stephen Harper's backyard. Um, uh, I'm told that, um, that Mark is going to expand on the 052 trial, correct? Uh, so I'm not going to expand on that, simply to say that there is now one randomized control trial that was presented at the Rome conference that showed definitively that prospectively, uh, you, when you evaluate this intervention, you get a 96% decrease on HIV transmission, uh, a 41% decrease in HIV-related morbidity and mortality, and an 84% reduction on uh, extrapulmonary tuberculosis. What a part of this somebody doesn't get? Uh, it is clear that treatment is the best way of preventing morbidity, mortality, and transmission. If we're not doing it, it's simply because we don't care. And I let uh, uh, Mark speak about the rest. Um, these new developments uh, uh, basically took the sixth uh, internationalized conference in Rome <laughs> by storm. Uh, everybody now is talking about treatment prevention, including Tony Fauci, saying that this is the 
cornerstone of combination HIV prevention. The economists had jumped in the bandwagon. They even had this beautiful slide that I modified freely, uh, as you see here. Uh, if, if the economy get, economist gets it, uh, you, you think uh, uh, Stephen will get it. Uh, China actually has embraced uh, uh, this notion, and they formally announced in February of this year uh, that they are adopting the treatment as prevention approach that we pioneer in BC uh, as the cornerstone of the Chinese uh, uh, national program, which goes to say that this is not a left or right issue. This is an issue of common sense. On that note, I'd like to stop and thank our collaborators on this work, especially uh, the NIH, who, which has funded a lot of this work, uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse uh, there, and, uh, and say once again that uh, uh, criminalization of HIV transmission uh, not only doesn't work, it's short-sighted, but undermines uh, the, good, the good work that we could do together. And I remind you, um, uh, women are advised to have a colposcopy once a year, uh, or, a, or, a, or a pap smear, sorry, uh, once a year, uh, uh, because of uh, HPV-related uh, uh, cervical cancer. That's a sexually transmitted disease. And you don't put the, the husband in jail because the woman had a cervical cancer or because she had an abnormal pap. Uh, we have to be consistent in our approach to these diseases, and unfortunately, HIV is being discriminated and stigmatized once again because of neglect and because of lack of understanding of what we should be doing to control it. Thank you.